Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, I'm sorry that things are taking a while and it's all a little confusing with no power, but we're very pleased to welcome you to the um, Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences noon meeting for July. And I'm very happy to um, have Jessica Dutton here with us. Jessica is a um, PhD candidate at the University of the Western Cape School of Public Health. Um, but the reason I asked her to present is that she is joining the Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences in the next few months as a postdoctoral fellow, which we're very excited about. And um, so this gives, and Jessica's in the process of, of wrapping up her PhD, and this gives her an opportunity to present some of her final results so that we can hear more about what she's been up to and working on. Um, so if you just give us one minute, I'm going to hand over to Jessica. Okay. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone. Um, my presentation today is on um, what drives disrespectful care in mid midwifery obstetric units, um, the perspective of nurses and midwives. Um, in case, um, for those who aren't aware of a mid midwifery obstetric unit, they are um, maternity, maternal health facilities. Um, majority of them are in the Western Cape. Um, they're midwifery run. There is a doctor on call um, and they do um, care ac across the continuum. So post um, postpartum delivery and postnatal care. Sorry, Lucy. Okay. Um, the way I'm going to um, go through my study, and this is the first time I'm presenting it all in one. I've presented individually, individual papers separately. Um, so if there's a little bit of overlap, that's because some of the papers um, do overlap. And there's also um, perhaps at times a bit of contradiction, and but I think that's an outcome of working in a complicated, or doing research in a complicated setting like healthcare. Um, so the aim of the study is to understand drivers of disrespectful care from the perspective of nurses and midwives at three midwifery obstetric units in Cape Town. I conducted um, 24 in-depth interviews um, with nurses. Okay, um, with nurses and midwives, um, and did 40 hours of observation at each clinic. Um, each clinic was very different in terms of experience. Um, at one clinic, I was sort of just given free range to be there whenever I wanted. Um, it was quite interesting because I had access to the entire clinic. It also kind of posed some ethical issues because that wasn't um, how the study was designed. Um, but I definitely got to see more in terms of what happens at the facilities. Um, I was there at any time where at the other end, a completely different experience was the third clinic I visited where it was very structured. I went in, I met with management, they had a room set up, um, which meant much kind of easier research process from my perspective, but um, I definitely didn't get the sense of kind of the textureness of the clinic uh, the way I did the first clinic. Um, and the study framework that I've used for this project is um, reproductive justice. And something I'll do before I talk about um, my findings is I will go over um, the terms that I've used. They may not be familiar, familiar to everyone. And apart from trying to learn more about what drives disrespectful care, we also wanted to um, add to the theoretical side of reproductive justice and what drives disrespectful care. So we wanted to build on ideas of reproductive justice. and. Um, and kind of the battle against obstetric violence. So these these terms will be discussed. Okay. Um, a major um, component to reproductive justice is that it's an in, it's an intersectional approach. That means that it looks at an issue um, from overlapping injustices. So it considers race, class, disability, sexuality. 
um, and it, in class, um, which was a big one for the study, um, and kind of considers everything um, on kind of how they're layered and how they interact with one another. Um, the way, this is where I just need to grab my notes. On the other side. We, we're, we're dropped in. You're still here? Oh, we're still there. Okay, we're just, we should be switching over. I think we're good. Keep going. Okay, so. Okay, I, yeah. And put it into. Okay, um, okay, we're back, I hope. Um, so, um, as I was saying before the, the um, connection disruption, um, the framework which I used for the study was uh, reproductive justice. Um, and a little bit of background, it's a um, kind of a notion that was originated in 1994 um, in response to um, actually a conference, um, the UN Population Conference, um, and that the focus on reproduction was mainly around reproductive rights. And it was a group of Black American women had come together um, after the conference and had decided that reproductive rights doesn't go far enough to consider where, what they felt was affecting um, Black American women in the US and um, opened, wanted to open up the conversation to what they call reproductive justice. In South Africa, it's often um, has been applied to talking around theory and action around abortion access, although this is changing and we are kind of moving more into ideas around birth justice. Um, but it's really to consider how power operates um, and to see things from a, a larger perspective in that reproductive justice is more than just rights to abortion. And what I found really useful was something that in its original conception in 1994, which is sort of not as commonly talked about anymore, is the is the right to have a child and to raise that child free of harm. And that includes state harm. Um, and to think of that in terms of childbirth. Um, another um, term that I worked with closely in my study was the idea of respectful maternity care um, within understanding barriers to quality of care, barriers to respectful maternity care was addressed. Um, there's been, a, well, I shouldn't say recently now, but fairly recently published um, respectful maternity care charter um, that was put together by the White Ribbon Alliance, and it articulates 10 human rights that should be granted to all women giving birth in a health facility, um, regardless of their socioeconomic status um, and the country which they are located. And this um, is a rights which includes the rights of the newborn as well as the woman and addresses issues such as autonomy, um, access to clean water, um, respectful care and dignity. Um, there's obvious limitations to the respect to maternity care charter. Um, although the rights are written into some international law, the charter lacks authority and governments such as South Africa are not accountable in most governments around the world to this charter. Um, and it raises questions about its power. Um, and the main focus on this study is what drives disrespectful care. So we know it happens in health facilities and we really wanted to figure out what's behind it, what and from the perspective of nurses and midwives. And within these debates, um, there's two sort of framing of disrespectful care um, and they're they're connected and they come together. Um, um, but um, there's some difference between the two, and I think it's important to kind of just to quickly go over the difference. And one area, one field, which is more the, I would say, global health, public health, looks at disrespectful care, where um, the other kind of field looks at, calls it obstetric violence. Um, and the, and that's more kind of a feminist um, gender studies lens. 
um, but they both include physical abuse, verbal abuse, non-consensual non care, acts of discrimination, uh, detention in facilities, um, non-dignity, and abandonment of care. Um, within South Africa, there's been some interesting work done around obstetric violence, um, and there's the argument that disrespectful care doesn't quite go far enough, that just a list of different harms is needed, is, is more than that is needed. And um, there is a definite need to frame obstetric violence as a particular form of gender-based violence. That means that happens um, against women because they are women, um, that it happens transnationally across different settings in the global south and the global in the sorry in the global north um rachel chadwick who is one of if you do any work in obstetric violence in south africa it's a name that you will see quite frequently um, and she states that that we need to consider and conceptualize obstetric violence not just as gender violence but as a specific form of violence against the reproductive subject this means that we sharpen our lens and look at make what makes this form of violence distinctive so what she's also um, capturing here, which isn't well captured in disrespectful care, is that um, for one, it's not only people who um, identify as women who are affected by obstructive violence, and two, that um, there's something particular about this type of violence, there's something particular about being violent towards a pregnant woman or a woman in labor that we need to really look at and um, theorize and look at more closely. Um, and now I will um, look at my findings. I was going to address each paper separately, but there's some overlap between the seven um, papers that have come out of my PhD. So um, I will kind of clump them, I think, together. But um, one of the one of the pa the paper from which we published, I think two years ago, um, reproducing neglect in the place of care, normalizing violence within Cape Town midwifery obstetric units, really focused on um, how neglect is the, the disrespect and abuse that happens, but we were really interested in how this was normalized and how it didn't seem to um, come up as anything you know, unusual within the clinic. Um, there would be times where women would be in labor and asking for help, and it really wasn't um, there wasn't a real a real like the, what their demands weren't really met. And there was also so there was that kind of more extreme neglect, but there was also just a way in which the clinic functioned that that clinical um, care was was given without kind of the personal respectful maternity care. And just to give an idea of what the, the settings were like, um, public maternal health system cares for 83% of the population. And, um, and there's, uh, sorry, um, the ma maternal mortality ratio is approximately 134 deaths per 100,000 live births. Um, the UN has called for all countries to, to get this number below 70. Um, and 64% of these deaths are uh, avoidable. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, it's avoidable. And this is not necessarily all due to neglect, but it is, uh, was one of our major findings. Um, and something that we want to connect within looking at neglect is how nurses and midwives work under conditions of duress, meaning that there's, there's always um, things are very unpredictable and there's always something they should be getting to and there's always more than one patient who they must be caring for. There could be up to 70 women waiting in the antenatal care at a time. So there was always this feeling of what, what we've called duress within the clinic. Um, and this is um, this is the second um, publication that came from our findings. Um, it was published in a book called Sexual and Reproductive Justice from the Margins to the Center. Um, and I will just read a little bit from, I think, the, the concluding comments just to give an idea. It's very much linked to our first paper around neglect, but it kind of, we had the opportunity to go into it deeper. Um, so this finding is, 
In South Africa, obstetric violence is rarely the outcome of policy or guidelines, but rather how past and present class, race, and gendered hierarchies shape healthcare services. In inaccurate to think of nurses and midwives as simply vessels of classist, racist, and patriarchal beliefs, but they are at the interface between discrimi a discriminatory system and those multiple and that multiplies the effect of the systematic violence, including poor black women. The clinic is one place where re reproductive justice plays out. This injustice harms those seeking maternal health care, including through the material conditions of the clinic. Nurse and, nurses and midwives are not exempt from this. They too are part of the population that is systematically discriminated against. Their status as midwives gives them power in the healthcare provider patient relationship, but does not protect them from a system built on racism and patriarchy. Childbirth de demands compassion, humanizing care. That, is, that this is denied because of economic and social status is a clear mark of injustice. Maternal health facilities in low resource settings are places where compassion is practiced piecemeal, but is extremely difficult to sustain. Given the ways inequality dominates the health system at present, when compassionate care is practiced in the maternity clinic, it is a demonstration of the possibilities of reproductive justice that resists systematic domination. That compassionate care is not sustained as a model of care in the clinic requires an examination of the conditions of within maternal health care. Neglectful acts such as guarding time, withholding care, and shaming as a form of obstetric violence are inexcusable. They may also be demonstrable forms of surviving a system that constrains and attacks social reproduction in multiple ways. It is in the acts of compassion that the knowledge needed to imagine improving the, the quality of maternity care offered in low resource clinics is produced and reproduced. Such knowledge production, if we can learn from it, needs to be free from any romanticized analysis or understanding of what is being assembled and violently unassembled. The possi possibilities for reproductive freedom, which is assembled partially through acts of compassion, also reimagine the values given to social reproduction and caring labor. The relative freedom one experiences in an MOU, both care provider and patient, is regulated in part by a lack of recognition that care is essential to life. Without this recognition, freedom within an MOU is always already severely constrained. One of the possibilities for reproductive justice lives in lives in through compassionate acts that work against a system of domination that structures much of the South African health system. Um, so our findings sort of jump and I probably should have found a way to kind of divided them up um, more clearly. So once this, the, what I had just read is kind of more overall looking at um, macro level impacts and macro level drivers, where we also kind of got down to look at what exactly nurses and midwives said on a daily basis um, stand in the way of them giving quality of care. And one thing that came up again and again was transportations from MOUs to referral hospitals, um, which is a major driver to poor quality of care. Um, and this is, like I had said early, comes with working under constant uncertainty. Um, nurses and midwives were never sure if the um, emergency vehicle would arrive in 45 minutes or 10 hours. Um, and some of these clinics, some of the referral clinics are a 15 minute drive and they end up waiting um, 10 hours for, for transportation. So these are some of the kind of on the ground issues that drive um, disrespectful care. Because we had it was COVID, um, and I had started this study, should I should have said earlier, in 2019, I collected this data pre-COVID, but um, it seemed um, it it seemed like we couldn't leave out and any of our findings um, that we were as, as I was writing at home. Um, in lockdown that I could completely deny COVID. And something that was interesting during during COVID-19 was that actually for, for a short period of time, we were seeing in mainstream media um, 
conversations around the labor wards and that women were giving birth without companions and that women were giving birth alone. And what I thought about was that this was sounded very much like the clinics um, and some of the things that nurses and midwives and I had talked about pre COVID. Um, the kind of this in the MOUs, this kind of battle between do we give women their privacy because the rooms are too because multiple women are birthing in one room or do we allow women to have labor companionship so this sort of i this sort of um, conversation around um, birth companions and doulas and should women have access to to labor companions and then on the other side what about their privacy um, that sort of came up during COVID-19 was something that South Africa has been addressing um, for for much longer and um, it kind of went to the, the, the conversation kind of disappeared um, it wasn't as if we kind of had this issue and then solved it we still don't know what to, uh, we still have women birthing without companions we still have a lack of privacy and we no longer have this international conversation around um, women's rights to care during labor um <laughs> One of um, kind of <laughs> more animated, I would say, nurses uh, topic nurses and midwives would would get would be around um, that patients have bad attitudes or that patients are uncooperative. Um, and this was very interesting, and this is where I say there's contradictions in my findings. Um, at one hand, I say that nurses and midwives do do their best to give care. Um, and at the other time, I say there's, you know, they're, they're sitting with me and telling me, oh, you know, these women are so out of control and they, the way they act in labor, they get under the bed and they don't listen. And this is, we're talking about women during childbirth, not listening. Um, it's quite absurd. But um, so the bad kind of the, the idea of the bad um, patient was was a theme and really drove a um, uh, a way and or drove the relation the way the relationship kind of under at least power dynamics within the relationship um so really came through within the way care providers talked about their patients and there seemed to be this construction and it is a construction because there aren't bad patients um the of this kind of infantile bad patient on one hand and the 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 good um kind of the midwife who's giving all of her time and giving on the other side and has to deal with this childlike bad patient. Um, so that was that was one of the the findings. Um, and the like it's important to say also that this was something that's been found in studies internationally. Um, this idea of this bad this bad woman in labor often more applied to women in poverty and more often to um, black women, and that. It's not invented within the clinics. Um, this is something that's being referenced. These are ideas that are constructed in society in general. Who is who should be reproducing? Who's who's the right kind of reproductive um, subject? And these kind of um, discourses get carried on and lived through in the maternity care ward. Um, so one of my when I started the PhD, um, I wanted to create a framework um, that looked at drivers to disrespectful care and obstetric violence. Um, and in 2019, this was done for me. And the um, author Bradley, um, with the collection of researchers, had come up with this um, this theory on disrespectful care. And I really thought it applied uh, very well to to what I found in this in the um, MOUs in Cape Town, um, as as you can see on the um, she has they have um, kind of divided it into three rings around each other um, with disrespectful care in the middle and controlling bodies, controlling knowledge, the midwife's role, and social distance and othering kind of directly affecting the clinics and around this 
mid midwives maintaining their status and power and control. And this is kind of what I was talking about in terms of constructing patients as bad and the midwives as good. Um, and then around that, as we get further away, we have kind of micro level drivers of gender inequalities, status of women, poverty and inequality, work environment and resources, hierarchical institutions and midwifery history and training. And then around that, we have even a higher level of ma macro level drivers, which are colonial legacy, structural inequality and health systems policy and drivers. Um, the only thing I would change if I was to redo this um, framework for us, the South African, um, for what from from our um, findings, is that I would have gender-based violence as a macro level driver, um, because I think that is something that it's not not it's not that it's not um, a global. A global problem, but it certainly came out very clear in, in our research and the research we looked at. And this takes me to where I am today. So I am wrapping up my PhD. Um, I sorry, I hope I was clear and I wasn't jumping around too much for everyone. Um, and as I write my conclusion and kind of a connecting all of my papers, what I've been really wanting to think about, um, and this is a way to kind of address everything I've talked about in the bigger picture is what do we mean by justice? Um, and what kind of justice do we wanna see in, in um, reproductive justice? And something else that um, I'm really trying to understand within this is we have this understanding that we have this you know, disrespectful, these actions that are disrespectful, these actions that be considered violence and that care is understood as their antidote. Um, but what happens when you have a term such as disrespectful care and now care is brought in and is no longer the antidote, but it can act, can it actually be violent? Can there be such thing as violent care? Um, and that is where I will leave us off with that question. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and thank you for everyone who tuned in. So, do you want to mute the system? Sure. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm not used to it. Sorry, it's a delay. Yeah, it's muted. Oh, no, no, yeah. your mic. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. I'm just gonna. I think we need to turn this up. Um, volume. Um, and thanks for joining us and thanks for your patience with the disruptions and thank you for your presentation. Um, we're going to take some questions now. So maybe we start with the room. Are there any questions in the room in person and then we can um, shift to the um, um, questions in the chat from online. So go ahead. I have two questions. Um, um, firstly, I was really intrigued that you had it was 40 hours of observation, which is fascinating. And I wonder whether that during the day or the night, because I picked up very different scenarios. And secondly, can you have violent care? I wondered how you interpreted care. Okay, so the questions are, um, I did quite extensive observations. So at um, what time of the day, the, or what, was it Was it a day or night? And um, how I'm thinking about whether or not we can have something called violent care. Does that capture? Yep. Um, and the, the first clinic I was at, where I was just sort of giving free range, I was there at night. Um, which was a really interesting time to get um, because there's no management around. Um, so you really get uh, a chance to sort of see how things work. Um, but the majority of the observations were done in the daytime, often while sitting in the antenatal clinic weight room with um, 
with patients. I was actually there so much that one of the pregnant women thought I was there for care. <laughs> so I was, I spent quite a bit, the first clinic, um, I was, I was there day and night. Um, and at the second and third clinic, I was only there during the day. Um, and the, the question of, of violent care is, is something that I'm, I'm also still trying to work out. And um, I think when care takes place within a setting that we haven't addressed violence yet, um, then we do get forms of violent care. Um, and um, I, I mean, you see this in, not just in uh, obstetric units, but kind of across in any setting of where there's care. And I guess it kind of asks is what kind of care do we want? Um, and when we have such an une an une situation or a context that's so unequal, um, and I often, I, I often, the, I, I kind of came to this conclusion while sitting in a park watching nannies take care of, black nannies take care of white children. And I thought, is this the kind of care as a society we want? And that's actually what led me to that question. Um, is this, do we, do we really have, um, do we have a politics of care and what would that look like? Yes. Thanks very much. Um, I really enjoyed it. I was sitting upstairs and I switched off by if you wrote it. Um, so I was, maybe I missed it, but I was struck by the fact you never mentioned you, young women. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> really like the pejorative attitudes about you, focus on young people. Yeah. Uh, which I actually found quite strange because one of my PhD students is doing work like reproductive health. was around um, adolescence and young people um, and uh, why it didn't come up in my presentation. And the second question was around um, antenatal care and whether or not um, obstetric violence or disrespectful care took place. And um, definitely, especially in the idea of a bad patient, there was definitely um, conversation around adolescence. But then there was also, I would say, an an equal amount of talk, but there was also, talk, and this is something that I feel gets left out as older women. Um, like they're also constructed as a bad patient. They're not the desirable reproducers. And um, nurses and midwives would talk about how they come to the clinic and they've already had children and they think they know what's going on. So there was kind of a way of framing older women and adolescents. Um, there was often a link between that's when you would really, when nurses and midwives would talk about the conditions and it was, you know, was, there's a lot of poverty or there's drug use seemed to be around. So there was this kind of idea of what an adolescent pregnant woman or a, a new mother looks like. That was, that was very much, um, I just didn't get to, there's a lot of things I had to leave out, um, but definitely adolescence is an area that deserves more attention um, and I think that there needs to be and linking to antenatal care even to think around antenatal care for adolescents like I think there needs to be specific kind of education and a way of talking to um, to adolescents and I would from what from my observations like I would arrive in the morning and the antenatal care would be quite bubbly quite alive and by the end of the day like women wait all day for to be seen. So by the end of it, that's when you start to see conflict. And that's when you start to see kind of people, patients and providers snapping at each other. They've just kind of had enough of being there all day. I mean, you're, the, the patients are sitting there pregnant and often a wooden, on a wooden bench. Um, but I would, there it wasn't, um, it, it was more of just this normalized, this is what people, this is what 
women in poverty should expect when they want antenatal care. Like, this is what, you know, and you should be thankful that you're getting. This was kind of the attitude rather than outright um, any form of, of abuse. And I didn't, I did not, but just this sort of normalized disregard for, for women's kind of time, especially with, yeah. Great, because we've got a bit of time, so let's okay. answer some questions. Yes. And stuff. Um, the first person whose hand I've got is Anthony, if you want to go ahead. I hope we will be able to hear you, but let's give it a go. Okay, well, this is a test. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> oh, good, good. All right, well, well, thanks for the presentation. I also had some technical difficulties on this side. I'm sitting in Malmesbury. Um, and so I apologize if I missed this particular uh, part, but I was just wondering, so until recently I was I was kind of working at Swartland Hospital and there they have about four deliveries every 24 hours and one cesarean. And um, I just noticed that yesterday um, they had eight. So I was just wondering if you had um, an idea from your research whether what is what is the impact of of numbers? Because I I mean I I start my my starting point is always staff don't intentionally uh, they're not intentionally rude to patients, but if they have enough pressure of numbers and and of through flow, then you know gradually the um, the the empathy kind of goes out the door and they and they become um, almost like automatons eventually. So I just wondered if that had come up in your research. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, definitely. And that's um, one of the things around the uncertainty that I think when we're looking at from the perspective of providers is the maternity ward is an extremely unpredictable place. Um, and I think that also affected the data collection because I found when I interviewed nurses and midwives who've just gotten off a busy ship, um, they had a lot more to say and they were much more angry at the system than a lot of the interviews that took place when the clinic was quiet, uh, when maybe there weren't any. There, I, I mean, there was always patients. There was always, you know, women in in every in all three clinics I went to in postnatal or in antenatal care. Um, but there wasn't always a woman in labor. And I think um, so I think it, it definitely I was say that's one of, from my um, research, one of the major drivers is how busy the clinic is and having to deliver, you know, to have to deliver, you know, two babies um, at the same time is obviously going to create a very stressful situation and that seemed to impact their attitude a lot. That's a good question. Hi, Sarah. Sarah, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. There you go. Yes, I will. Go ahead. Um, okay, so I, I recently, this is actually kind of in, in line with, with what you just responded to, um, but I recently commit, um, completed my um, thesis, thesis on dignity in sub Saharan African health systems. And one of the, the key barriers to patient dignity um, was, in fact, professional dignity. Um, healthcare workers weren't respected from the system, therefore they were unable to, to provide the quality care that, that is envisioned in, um, in this quality care frameworks. And I'm just wondering, you know, beyond like the duress and the overload and the um, understanding, what about like professional um, opportunities for professional development or um, just other areas that you, I'm wondering if you would all saw similarities with a lack of professional dignity, which contributed to a lack of quality care being provided to patients. Okay, uh, thanks, Sarah. So um, you're asking around um, around um, professional um, opportunity, and um, I think that this differs. I don't think this can this finding can be necessarily applied uh, across the across even the country. Um, but I I got the sense that uh, I trained as a midwife in Canada, and I got the sense that um, midwives were very qualified. Um, there was a lot of knowledge. Um, they we had really like interesting in depth conversation around clinical care as well, which sometimes would get the ball rolling. Um, there are this isn't necessarily the um, incentive 
I know um, some of the nurses who who haven't done the four year nursing degree, but I've done like a two year auxiliary program who felt, you know, that they were kind of stuck and that seemed to be a, um, they did the lack of motivation that they couldn't um, kind of, there isn't a, um, a program where you can work and study to kind of um, to become the next level of nurse in South Africa. So if there was some frustration um, on the part of auxiliary nurses, but I found in terms of qualifications and um, that to be, you know, very high standard. Um, at, for, and this is, I'm just speaking at the clinics that I, that I uh, went to and who I spoke to. Do you want to answer Sue's question mm -hmm. sure. um, in the uh, chat? Just because I think it's useful. Okay. As in as and then in CQ. Yes, sure. Um, I'm just going to read a question from Sue Falkes. Um, did you get any sense that there were any programs to improve the spectrum of maternity care and MOUs? And do you think, given the context, there is the possibility to change things from within the MOU? Um, one of the clinics um, had, the, the third clinic I, I visited had recently had a new um, sister in charge, and she seemed to have an emphasis on patient, patient treatment. And I did get the sense that it was also a less busy clinic, so it kind of relates back to the previous question um, around um, how busy a clinic and how unpredictable things are, how that affects care. But there was much more talk around supporting women. Um, one of the nurses came out and showed me that they had a one of those big yoga balls, those birthing balls. Like there just seemed to be little things put in place to sort of give that little additional um, attention to how women experience childbirth. Um, and do I think there's possibilities for change? Um, I think there needs to be uh, there needs to be a lot more support from the government. Um, I think, um, but I'm not I'm not unhopeful. Um, I was actually very inspired by the midwives and nurses that I spoke to, um, and I do think that there's possibility to change. And there are, I've recently learned about a program that's working um, that I need to reach out to in um, Limpopo that actually works in compassionate care. So it'll be interesting to see what they're doing um, working with nurses and midwives. So there are things out there and I think maybe what there needs to be is also a way to better connect what's going on in the country um, because there's this project in Limpopo that I you know, I only heard about four years into my PhD. Um, same thing with the emergency obstetric project that's going on in KZN. There's all these kind of smaller projects going on that I think we need to get away to kind of get the word out about the ways that this is being addressed and what's being done. And um, was it in Siki? Yes. Um, do you have a question if you want to unmute yourself? Um, yes, I have. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Jessica, for a lovely presentation. Uh, we, we don't have uh, undergrads, uh, I mean, nursing uh, in our undergraduate programs uh, because most of the values and skills that we teach, uh, I mean, they seem to be a challenge and, and have uh, dominated your, your, your presentation. What I wanted to ask you is, um, I mean, considering what you said earlier on about your framework and where you would place um, uh, violence, gender-based violence, um, would you say that um, just because they, there's a perception that um, the nurses and midwives are working in a system that is in itself violent, are they reproducing those behaviors and reenacting them on, on, on vulnerable patients? Because I mean, if you're thinking about the, these attitudes, you know, you're too young to have a child or you're too old uh, to, to have that. It means that already somebody is judgmental in approaching uh, the service that they provide uh, to to those patients, and and uh, and then one wonders then about uh, the, their responsibilities as healthcare providers. Uh, you know, not not necessarily maybe looking at um, the, the the professional responsibility, but sometimes just the moral uh, responsibility in itself, and and how they enact uh, what they are supposed to provide to patients. So, can you just comment on that? Yeah, um, yes. this, uh, this is the 
the complicated thing about violence, and I think that's why there's so much theorizing about about the subject is, you know, is someone, what do we do when people who are placed in situations of violence act violently? Um, and who this sort of perpetrator victim binary gets, there is, doesn't hold in this situation. There is, there, I wouldn't say, not that, not to, I, I give nurses and midwives their agency. They, they can be, um, they can behave in ways that are, are disrespectful. That's, I'm not saying that, but, but I don't think that they're necessarily perpetrators either. I think um, that it's, it's much more complicated than that. And um, yeah, I, it's a good question. <laughs> um, and I'm, we're, we're still trying to work that out. Um, but thank you. I hope I addressed, I hope I answered the question. We're out of time. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks. That Thanks, everybody. We're actually out of time, and I'm sorry because I know we had a, a break in the middle, so um, we, we didn't have the full hour. But thank you very much for your fantastic questions and engagement and for sticking around despite the technical issues. Um, and I think this presents an opportunity to link up because I know there's quite a few people on the call that are working in this space and, um, and other people who are clearly interested. I see there's some other questions that we'll take note of in the chat and, and reach out to to people to talk more about. Um, but thanks, Jesse, for, <laughs> for doing this for us. And thank you, everybody, for, for um, attending and for the, the useful and um, interesting questions. Have a lovely afternoon. Goodbye.